All right. So today we're here with Dr. Phil Mathetone, founder of the 180 formula for heart rate training in the math method. I don't know. I call it the math math method. Is that what you call it? Or do you have a, a specific terminology for that? Well, I think most people refer to it that way and they think math is my, my, right. you know, the first three letters of my last name, but it's not. It's uh, MAF stands for maximum aerobic function. And it's a important concept in, in training in sports and overall health because the aerobic system is such a, a powerful um, part of our body. Sure. Now, let me ask you, did you, even though it stands for maximum aerobic function, it, is that also, was it, is it do double entendre where you wanted to do, have it line up with your name there? Well, I didn't intend on doing that uh, until someone mentioned it to me. It was probably a year after I started using <laughs> it, lecturing and write. I had written some articles. The original idea, because in the beginning, uh, when I first started in the 70s, I was seeing a lot of runners. The running boom was, you know, just exploding. And mm -hmm. I, my clinic was in the, you know, the northern suburbs of New York City. So I saw a lot of runners and I was a runner and um, I started measuring people and testing them with, you know, this is pre um, wireless heart monitors uh, with a device that I was able to monitor their pulse during a run. And I de developed a test and the test was, you know, referred to as the maximum aerobic pace. And I thought, well, MAP is a good, you know, a good, uh, good, sure. good way to ex express that. And I, it didn't take me long to realize that, hey, wait a minute, that's already taken in exercise physiology, maximum aerobic power, uh, mm -hmm. MAP. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm going to find something that's, you know, and I was starting to see other um Athletes, cyclists, and uh, triathlon had just come to the East Coast at that point. And I worked in motorsports, and I worked in uh, baseball and football. You know, and I thought, well, we we can't have pace because we're not always measuring pace. Right. And le let's right. call it function, maximum aerobic function, and it sort of was was useful across all all sports. So maybe you can get into that a little bit. What what exactly is maximum aerobic function? And also, you know, we, I mentioned in the beginning the 180 formula. And maybe talk about those two, but I also want you to give a brief kind of bird's eye view of what heart rate training is. Because right now, I think it's a lot of runners are interested. I think a lot of runners are doing the traditional runner thing where it's just like going all out trying to get a hard workout in every time and it's not working. A lot of people's paces are staying this plateauing or maybe even getting worse or very yep. incremental increases with a lot of injuries. And I'm, I, and I think people, it's funny cause when I, whenever I mention heart rate training to people, it's like everyone wants to talk about it. Like they, people are very interested in it, but I think a lot of people are just don't know. It's like this thing that's they've heard about, but don't exactly know what it is. So maybe kind of just give like a brief overview of that and the whole and everything. Yeah, it's that. gone from from being an unknown. I mean, early on when I was when I was doing it, there were there were no other people doing that. Uh, Lydiard, um Arthur Arthur had a great mm -hmm. system, but he didn't like um, the idea of wearing a heart monitor. I finally got one on him and showed him what it was, and he said, "Well, I you know this is interesting, but uh, it makes me nervous." <laughs> and so. <laughs> Um, heart rate training was sort of like, well, why do you, why do you need a heart rate? What, you know, who cares? You just go out and run. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and then it eventually and quickly, you know, turned into, um, a whole bunch of hype stuff around, um, using a heart monitor. And of course the digital technology, when it came on board, um, it, it gave us the ability to, uh, download our workout onto our computer, and um, and now sure. everybody's sharing those. And and it's still a lot of it is still uh, look how high I got my heart rate, you know, going up this hill. <laughs> um, right. Well, and and in the beginning when heart monitors came out, that was sort of because I would survey people, um, and the most common reason for having a heart monitor was to see how high how your heart rate got. Well, that's cool. That's you know. <laughs> So um, my whole thing in going back to when I was still a student was that I, I wanted to work with athletes 
and I and my my philosophy was I wanted to help them a be healthy and b become more fit, become a better athlete, but not at the expense of their health. And mm -hmm. how how was I able to do that? Well, um, monitoring the heart rate is a is a a, a pretty good guide because. Um, the heart rate reflects, of course, um, the autonomic nervous system. When we're when we're more stressed, our heart rate goes up, and um, so if we're running and we're more stressed, the heart rate's going to be higher. And of course, if we're running at a higher intensity, the heart rate's higher, inferring more stress. Sometimes you need that sure. stress, such as during um, competition, of course, and and during uh, hit training, during high intensity whatever kind of high intensity training you might do. But the aerobic system is such an important feature of the human body to be both healthy and fit. Mm -hmm. And in running, unless you're in track and field, in running, um, we're, we're in an endurance sport. So we want endurance, and that means aerobic function. That's our long-term energy system. And because of that, it's a system that burns fat for energy, a high amount of fat for energy. We still burn glucose, but um, uh, potentially uh, we burn more fat. And the more fat we burn, uh, the better our endurance. And right. the heart monitor became a way to say, you know, we could we could bring people into the lab. And in the beginning, I was doing that, but it was really cumbersome. It was hard to get a lab. It was I mean, it was it was just not practical, and for most um, for most runners, for most athletes, it was not um, it just wasn't uh, a, a practical thing to do. So we needed a better way, and you know, I, I started using the monitor to um, see what you know, see if we can really zoom in on the ability to build the aerobic system in a very effective, quick way. And when did you, what, what, what's the time frame of this? How long ago did you start doing that? Uh, 1977. God, I've, now I'm like aging myself. Right? <laughs> that's all right. Like um, there yeah, are so age that, groups. And at that time, it was, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know, misconceptions, things not known. I mean, I remember just reading in, I mean, I was born in 1982, but just reading about the 60s, 70s, even 80s, there was, Doctors were telling people not to even hydrate during races, uh, or I mean, some doctors, I'm sure some were, but there is a lot of things that today we think of as like, like, honestly crazy that you would ever do that during a run, but that were kind of like the traditional method back then. I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, back then people, uh, runners were also let all about when it was running, running means let go fast, hard running. Um, and and I don't, I know the, um, I mean, I know, I guess the book, the jogging book was a big hit um, back in the day, but, and so I guess there was a segment of joggers, but even I feel like joggers, it was still like, you wanted to feel like you were getting your heart rate up, getting it work out. Like you were saying, seeing how high you could even get your heart rate, which meant like you were supposedly more fit or, you know, losing weight, whatever. I, I, so I was kind of wondering how maybe you um, could convince people or even that you had this idea at, the, at a time when it was, uh, there was a lot of misconceptions around running and, you know, performance. It, it was not easy. It was, um, you know, people would call me all kinds of names. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, um, you know, part of my clinic had to do with uh, treating athletic injuries. And there were plenty of those. And I was lucky enough to be able to do that successfully and quickly. And when... When a runner comes in and, and can't race or can't even train because of a knee problem or a back problem, um, and suddenly I'm, I'm able to help them, they tend to start listening to all the other weird things I, I say, uh, <laughs> especially when I say things like, well, your injury is because you're not training correctly. You're training too hard in particular. Um, and, and so that kind of helped things along. But, you know, we're, we're still, and we were back then even more, in a no pain, no gain society. Mm -hmm. And that society, um, you know, it, it, it leaks over into the running community, running exercise in general, um, just like corporate 
you know, CEOs are under the same pressure and a lot of other individuals um, have this attitude of no pain, no gain and more is better. And so in running, more speed is better, more miles, that's better. And um, we don't want to, we don't want to taper before race day. We want, we don't, we want to jump right into it, you know, and, and it just, the, the logic was lacking. That was a big part of the problem, the physiological logic mm -hmm. Um, and it, typical of, of society, um, our, our trendiness, our no pain, no gain attitude takes right. over and, um, and that makes it dangerous. Yeah. So, okay. So we're, you, you, you started out with this idea and now let's talk about the implementation. How, how exactly does heart rate training work for, uh, say someone listening to this podcast, if they're looking to improve their aerobic system, aerobic function, um, what's the kind of general overview of that? Yeah, so uh, heart monitoring is, is really biofeedback. We want feedback. We want our brain to get feedback from the body. What's, what's going on here? And then we want to respond to that. So uh, you look at your heart rate and you, you, know, you have some plan ahead of time, hopefully, and you look at your heart rate and that's, you know, you're, at, you're out of the zone you've decided to train in and, and now you've got to slow down. That's sort of the typical um, uh, response uh, to, to an individual, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but, but basically, um, there's two important things in terms of the, the heart rate. One is it, it can guide us during training and, and we're talking about the whole spectrum of the of the workout from the early um, warming up process to maintaining a certain uh, range of, of heart rate uh, to the cool down. So the, the warm up, we, we start at a very low heart rate and gradually build up the, the heart rate as the pace increases. And then we maintain that at some, some level, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment. And then uh, before the end of the workout, we want to do just the opposite of the warm up. We want to slowly, you know, come down in intensity and therefore heart rate. We won't get down to the same heart rate we started at, but we'll get reasonably close. And right. that that workout is an incredibly healthy stimulation in addition to benefiting our our muscles and our metabolism and everything else that we're um, trying to improve through through running. Um, the other thing about heart rate is that it, it can tell us if we're on the right course, if we're on the right, if we're going in the right direction, are we headed to an injury or are we headed to improving our, our running, competing better right. uh, as, as yeah. an example of that. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, you're, you're, you kind of laid out how doing a workout, you know, you find there's a certain heart rate that you want to hit or stay under, I should say. What, how do people find that specific heart rate? And is that something that they do for all their runs or how does that work if someone's trying to improve their aerobic function? Yeah, uh, in the very beginning, I, I did, you know, I determined someone's heart rate training zone individually it's still an individual thing that's the that's the game you you can't say well everybody you know who's who's in this age group should train at that heart rate it doesn't work that way we we're right. all individuals and we should find our own level of training if we really want to get the most out of every run and and avoid injuries and improve our performance so I would do a, you know, it was a clinical uh, approach that I took. I evaluated the athlete physically. I, I did a, a good history of their their exercise, their racing, uh, their injuries, um, and we did blood tests. And we and then we'd go to the track and I'd look at their gait at different heart rates and blah blah blah. And it took it was a long um, it was a long process. And then we'd come up mm -hmm. with a. A heart rate zone, you know, exercise between here and here, and um, and then I um, I was lecturing somewhere uh, at one point and talking about all this, and someone raised their hand and said, "How how can we do that?" 
And I was a little embarrassed because I didn't have an answer. But I knew there was a, you know, it's all math. I mean, there's so much math right. going on in the body. And I figured, okay, I've got to... I got to come up with an answer to that question, and and I came up with a formula called the 180 formula, and um, the 180 formula is radically different than the 220 formula, which is a cookbook thing. It's you you do this, you do that, and then that's what you know that's what you train with. Uh, the 180 formula wants you to individualize. Um, your brain and body, it, it takes into account your overall health and your overall fitness. So if you're injured, if you're unhealthy, if you're just beginning, if you're coming back from an injury or f from, you know, if you're in rehab, the, the numbers are going to be different, even though right. you have 100 people that are the same age, um, it, it has to be individualized. So right. that 180 formula, people can find that online. Um, uh, you you subtract your age from 180, but then you have to modify it based on a, a number of things. If you're really healthy and you're improving in racing, then you can raise that heart rate a little bit. If you're unhealthy or if you're injured, uh, if you're on medication, um, you know, if there are problems, then you have to lower the heart rate. And probably 90% mm -hmm. of the people who follow the 180 formula initially will go slower than they used to go yeah. to the point where they're they're annoyed they get mad at me they're oh. frustrated they say hey you how, this what is this going to do i'm just you know yeah. these old ladies are passing me <laughs> as someone who's done this before um i remember well, actually i'm kind of restarting it right now because I, I i did it for a year from like 2020 to maybe 2021 and then I kind of fell off the wagon, just kind of a lot of things in life and other stuff and kind of just, uh, you know, fell apart. But now I'm, I've been picking it back up in the last month. But I remember when I first started doing heart rate training with the math method, like 180 minus my age, I was completely shocked at how slow I was running and walking because there was definitely walking involved. Um, and it was, there's a thing that people it was very hard to get past and I'm glad I finally got past it, but there's definitely the Strava guilt or whatever you call it, that <laughs> posting runs to Strava running at a 10 minute pace, um, which was, you know, a minute or 10 30, even sometimes two minutes slower than I was used to was something that was actually like a mental block. I really had to get past and I don't care anymore. Um, and I realized that also nobody else cares either, but <laughs> it was, it was a, it was, it was something that was a little bit shocking to me at first. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and I think a lot of people it, have that problem. It, yeah. It's, I had that problem. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it is shocking, but what that level is really, it's the, it's the level of your aerobic systems fitness. Mm -hmm. and so if yeah. your aerobics system isn't in good shape, you better do something. Um, you know, people who don't have a good aerobic system that keep pushing themselves are the ones who get uh, physical injuries, uh, metabolic injuries, uh, mm -hmm. bio, you know, the biochemical problems that go wrong in the brain, like depression and in the body, like um, accumulation of excess body fat or mental, emotional um, uh, injuries, um, you know, which would be depression too. But, but that's, that's um, you know, and, and people who die uh, are in the same boat. And, and, you know, I hate to even bring that up, but it's a reality. We see death in athletes um, still way too often. And, um, and it's, it's unacceptable. So if your aerobic system is not in great shape, you're not healthy, and you're never going to really race your your best. That's really right. the for for many people. That's the it's the hook that says, oh, yeah, well, I'm willing to sacrifice my health, but I'm not willing to never reach my athletic potential. So, yeah. So, OK, we got to yeah. play that game. That's OK. And it's it's one of those things that that I, when I was doing it, I experienced um, a it was difficult at first because of that, you know, a lot of the long runs and things that I did with other people, 
you basically instead of keeping up with the group you have to hang back it's a little bit lonely i'm not gonna lie and then uh but then also you get to run with people that you didn't get to run with before so in some ways it's cool and then uh it takes it doesn't it, it it takes a long time but i will say the time goes faster than you think it does and you start improve you see the improvements you know after a month two months it comes quicker than you think but in the it's one of those things where every day seems long but then it seems short once you look back and then when you do get those improvements i mean i i remember for 2020 i didn't i didn't do a single speed workout for a year and i don't run a lot like i don't run huge miles i run from marathon training i run 40 to 50 you know so somewhere in that range so it's not like 80 100 like a lot like some more elite runners and in after that year of no speed workouts just running slowly i ran a like i pr my half marathon by six minutes like a hour 30 marathon and it was the best race i've ever had in my life and yeah it was, I mean, that, it that was incredible it yeah i mean that's yeah. that's and 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 you were probably a lot healthier for it and um mm. and and just for people who don't who who missed this point earlier and are, are still uh, uh, unsure when we talk about improving we're talking about getting faster at that same training heart rate right yeah and so that. <laughs> and what, what happens is um it's not uncommon for people to uh initially start that going slower than they think they should go because you know some people are macho some people are embarrassed to be seen by you know i used to tell runners you know train at night when nobody could see you <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um and then and then as the weeks go by now they start getting faster and faster at the same heart rate and at some point they start complaining that they're going too fast <laughs> it's like well wait a minute you it was three months ago you were complaining you were right. you were too slow um right. it it happens sooner on a bike because the the gravity stress is not there and um, but mm -hmm. but for a runner, um, if you're disciplined, and that's the key, discipline oh, uh, in following that that training heart rate, in one to two months you should see a measurable difference. And I recommend people go to the track once yeah. a month and and warm up and then uh, run. I, I like to go three miles. If you're new, just go one mile. Mm -hmm. But I like to see three, four, even five miles of yeah. running at that 180 formula heart rate that you're not exceeding in training and you'll be able to see that oh gee now i'm going you know 20 seconds a mile faster yeah and then and of that, course people exactly say well what... that's you know that that's not a lot i <laughs> you know it's it, only it's a, a month huge... away exactly and i that's how i was i was doing the track uh measuring it with track workouts at once a month and exactly it's just and it doesn't feel like it's it doesn't feel any different, but when you actually look at the data and your, um, and your and your you know times, you're like, oh, it actually is 20 seconds per mile faster. My yeah, heart rate's it, staying at staying at 140 or whatever, you know. It feels the same because your heart rate's the same. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. what a concept. <laughs> I mean, this is the problem. People have the wrong concepts, um, and and we need to put something more logical in it that pertains to physiology. Um, mm -hmm. rather than anything else. So, um, and, and I've seen people who, you know, in, in within a year, they're going a minute a mile faster. Um, and then they're two minutes a mile faster. And, you know, now they're really complaining. I, how could I do this every day? Well, you feel the same, right? Well, yeah. But. <laughs> yeah right, exactly. But oh, it's, yeah, it's, and, so, and so that's the sub max. Yeah. You're measuring sub max. And, the submax performance in the human being is related to the maximum performance in the human being. So every time your submax pace gets faster, so will your competitive pace automatically get faster. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Yeah, it's a, uh, and I, I've seen so many people where, because um, I'm, I'm in the extra mileage Facebook group with 
for Skierman because he um, with his program and there's so many people and what's amazing is that it's not just fast people or slow people. it's literally everybody from 20 years old to 60 people PRing their marathons at 65 years old um, just by you know after a six months or year of doing the the math training it's pretty incredible uh, it's it's the the expectation I mean when 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 I was you know when I was really in the trenches working with with athletes if I didn't see those incredible changes I thought something's wrong and that mm. something could be well we've got the wrong heart rate um maybe they're running too few miles maybe they're running too many miles or maybe their stress levels are too high and that'll that'll impair sure. uh progress so you know in the beginning when I started this I thought it was a a, 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 a test for, for stress because people who are stressed are going to have a higher heart rate, whether they're resting or, or moving. Um, and then I thought, well, well, no, it's, 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 it's not, it's different than that. And then I thought, well, this is a great, um, uh, weight loss program because when you're training at that level, you're teaching right. your body to burn more fat rely mm -hmm. more on fat and, and fat burning and rely less on glucose. And and I thought, well, no, it, it seems to correlate where when people start burning more fat, they get faster. And so putting the whole thing together, you know, was was what I did in those early years. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I had a lot of guinea pigs. Uh, all, all those all those <laughs> runners I used um, were part yeah. of it. <laughs> And I think that, um, and that's maybe something we should mention too, is that of course keeping it low and slow for um, for your heart rate while training is is a key. But also, you want to it's a holistic approach where you do have to think about your sleep, your nutrition, um, you know, whether it's cross training or doing some other things to make sure your strength, you know, you're you're strong physically. And so maybe you talk about that a little bit as well, because I know you're a big nutrition yeah. guy too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, w when we're done a workout. We haven't finished yet. We, we we are only starting because we have to go through this recovery phase. And in the recovery phase is where we really get all the benefits of the workout. And so if we don't recover, uh, we, we haven't benefited from the workout. And sleeping is such a big part of, of recovery. And like I said earlier, the, the cool down, proper cool down is, is the first stage of recovery. Very, very important. To, to you know, so the talk sprint about the to cool the down. finish is not a not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, talk about the cool down because I think a lot of runners, and I'd say I'd even include myself in this. You know, you're trying to fit fit in the run before kids get up, before you have to go to work, whatever, and you do your run, finish, grab a glass of water, get moving. You know, it's just run right up to your door, done, and and jump into your day. So tell me more about the cool down, how, how important that is. Yeah, I mean, that, that whole, what you just explained is sort of our, our frantic society that we all have gotten ourselves into. And, um, I, you know, the biggest thing for me was seeing um, these athletes who would wake up at 4 a.m. because uh, it was the only time to get a workout in. And I, I would say, well, I'd rather right. you cut your training time in half than to deprive yourself of proper sleep. And and some athletes took that serious and stopped doing it and really cut their training in half and ended up running incredible PRs uh, quickly as, as a result of it. So the cool down, mm. you know, you, you, wow. you build this into your workout. If you're going to do an hour workout, an hour workout includes the warm-up, maintaining your, your aerobic heart rate, and then the cool down. And so... Let's say you you're running in the morning. You get up. You're not you're not quite loose yet. You you want to warm up a little more, and it's interesting because you don't have to stretch to get flexibility because the the aerobic warm up does that as well as stretching without the risk of harm, which stretching mm -hmm. can do. So let's say you're 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 starting really slow. You're walking for a few minutes, and now you're you're jogging really slow. Your heart rate, you know, is slowly coming up to where you want it to to be maintained in the in the middle part of the run. And 
After 15 minutes, you're now at that heart rate. Let's say it's 145. You maintain 145 or don't exceed 145 uh, until 15 minutes before the end of the workout where you start to now come down just like you opposite, like you did uh, on the on the warm up. You slowly bring the heart rate down to 140 to 135 to 130. And then you walk for a few minutes and your heart rate is going to be um, reasonably low now. But now you've started cooling down and that's such an important thing to do. Yeah. And so, okay, so then it, you cool down. Um, and it, you mentioned sleep. What's your, what do you think is the optimal you know, sleep time for athletes? For any human is seven to nine hours. And healthy how much people is, how much t- tend to need oh, less. Seven. So seven or seven and a half. Okay. Uh, people who oh, need more recovery need need more, like nine hours. And and I'm not talking about you know lying down. I'm talking about sleeping, uninterrupted mm, right. sleep. And um, and and it, it there's you know there's no it's not a macho thing where if you're macho you don't need as many hours. <laughs> and I, yes, I know you can get along with four hours, but it's not you know it's going to have an un- how- unhealthy effect on your on your body. I don't know how. People do like four hours. I mean, personally, I always get seven hours. I feel, I mean, unless it's like a weird thing, like we're traveling or something and I have to get up super early, but seven hours is my go to every night. And I feel like if I, even if I get six and a half, I know it the next day. Like I feel like I'm more stressed. Like I'm more, like just feel on an edge. And I, I, yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't know how people do it when they get only get five or five and a half hours. I just imagine like being on that edge all the time. Here's how they do it. And and I I congratulate you for for being aware of your body. That's really one of the things that that this kind of training will do is it'll it'll expand your mind, it'll make you Mm -hmm. aware of your body. Um, And so if you only get six and a half hours of sleep, and you notice it, I have the same problem, I get about seven hours, seven, maybe seven and a half. And if Mm -hmm. I don't get enough, I know it. I know it right away. And uh, you know, I used to when I would teach doctors this stuff, I, I would sometimes say, um, a lot of patients wouldn't know it if their arm fell off and until somebody said, Hey, what (laughs) happened to your arm? Um, You know, that awareness of your health is very important. And um, uh, so all of this is 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 geared to being healthy and fit. And I want to keep emphasizing that because um, it's important. We want to be running when we're 90 and 100 and 110. We want to be the first in that 110 age group, um, you know. Yeah. And, and so but, you know, so another factor that's probably more important than everything we've talked about is the food we eat very mm. very important because here we are we're training the aerobic system which is our fat burning system includes our our slow twitch muscle fibers which by the way support all our joints uh and if we have a good aerobic structure from a, a, a neuromuscular standpoint our joints are going to be more supported we're going to be less injured and so on and so forth sure. however the food we eat directly immediately influences our metabolism and our aerobic system so to cut to the chase if you're eating junk food you're going to turn off your aerobic system no matter how you go through the heart rate stuff no matter how slow or proper you train um Mm -hmm. if especially before you go out if you you know if you drink a um a glass of uh sugary stuff or eat a sugary snack um you're turning off your aerobic system which means you're shifting from high fat burning to low fat burning and relying on glucose which means you're going to use up your glycogen stores um fairly quick uh because you don't have any other fuel to use so um that's that's not a good thing and uh, it, sadly so I've been I've been watching I've been looking at runners it's not just runners but athletes across the board since the 70s when I was a, you know still a student I was starting to evaluate um, all this all this stuff um, but today what's happened is the the population of the world has become more and more over fat 
over mm-hmm. fat being defined as excess body fat that impairs health and fitness. Right. Right. And all you have to do is go to a, 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 a marathon uh, or a 10K, a 5K, yeah. and, you know, look at people. And it's sad that this increase in over fat prevalence has also affected the athletic community. So it's not about how many calories you burn. It's about what kind right. of calories you burn. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, especially in America, it seems that you know, processed foods and sugars are, I mean, sugars are in literally everything. I think everybody kind of has realized that at this point, and it's so hard to avoid them. And especially, if, I mean, I'm speaking from personal experience. I feel like when you're in the sugar cycle, it's uh, it's hard to get out of that because it's like, you know, even if you go a couple meals without, you know, like sugar, it's like your body is just starts rebelling against you. <laughs> well, they'll, they'll be they'll be classifying sugar as addictive soon because all the pieces are there now uh, for the mental mm-hmm. health uh, world to say, okay, now we've 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 accepted the fact that sugar is addicting. Well, if if you're eating the average diet, um, which is very high in refined carbohydrates, which turns to sugar immediately when you eat it, and of course mm-hmm. the straight sugar stuff in in beverages and foods hidden away there um and you've tried to even cut down let alone get off it you know how hard it is it's it's not yeah. easy but um <laughs> it it can be done and th- that will affect your aerobic system uh, more than anything so that you know, we're, we're, we're many talking about, like I just said, the, the refined carbohydrates, which most carbohydrates in the marketplace today are refined. They're refined yeah. um, for a variety of reasons. But what makes that unique is that as soon as you eat them, it turns to sugar as if you were eating a bowl of white sugar. Wow. Right. OK, it's Man. it's that simple. And so yeah. why why have we gotten into this dilemma? It's it parallels the tobacco uh industry and what they did to get people hooked on cigarettes in fact um and i've used this line myself but you're now seeing in the scientific journals uh research that's published about this topic that says sugar is the new tobacco oh yeah i mean i remember what was the thing where it was like the coke like there was like not doctors recommending coke but it was saying like I was trying to, I read this thing before and it was, you know, you'd have like the whatever board approving like this sugary cereal. Gatorade. It might have been cereals. Or, what was it? Was it, like it was Gatorade. Gatorade uh, Coke had, a, yeah. had an issue. It was the, it was the, I think it was the American Council on Sports Medicine. I, I can't remember. There's so many examples of it, but it's, it, you yeah. know, uh, most, you know, some, some of your listeners are going to remember when doctors were advertising cigarettes. Oh, right. Exactly. So, yeah, like um, this is you know, the, when, the best cigarette for your for the active person or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And if you have a sore throat, smoke the menthol because it right, right. soothes. The, you know, and now <laughs> we, 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 we look at these ads and people laugh. Um, but at the time, uh, it was very mm-hmm. believable. They spent a lot of money, the tobacco industry. And, um, you know, we, we, we unfortunately, we've... Um, as much as we've we've banned uh, tobacco advertising, uh, you know, you remember probably the Virginia Slims 10K. And oh, yeah. Ex, you know, so yeah. that's all gone away now, which is great. But there are more uh, cigarettes sold today than ever in the world. So um, the perception is that, you know, we've 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 solved the, the tobacco problem. Well, we, we haven't. Still oh there. no, and uh, I mean, speaking of which, like, I and I, I know I'm not sure if you're what you're talking about is exactly keto or if it's just more like na- if you're talking about natural sugars. Maybe I wasn't sure like along those lines, but it, so there again, it's yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, it it's it's like heart rate training. It's like you know we're all individuals. Okay, so. What's important for me and how little carbohydrate I have to eat or what my maximum carbohydrate level is to feel good 
is going to be different than yours. It's it's not only yeah. age, but it's um, our backgrounds. There's some genetic influence, um, uh, and again, you can you know I have something called the two week test uh, that you can apply to yourself and experiment to see how much okay. carbohydrate makes you feel good and and bad and that way you'll have a pretty good idea but but my recommendation is always to get rid of all the junk food first mm. and then the the question is how much natural carbohydrate can you okay. consume and that that, yeah. that varies because that seems more like a reasonable approach i mean i don't know i one time i would try to do the keto thing this is a couple of years ago when it was super hot and i mean one of my friends at work really got where i worked before here it was I mean, it worked for him. Like he was all in on it, got super fit. Just like he also had that discipline. I mean, did great with it. Uh, I tried to do it for, I think I did it for 10 days. And I, honestly, no joke, it was harder than quitting cigarettes because I quit cigarettes 10 years ago. And it was, I'm not kidding you, the cravings were way worse and just felt worse. I felt like than quitting nicotine. And uh, that was, honestly, that was a little scary to me. Because, like, I shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. And it means that you weren't doing it right. Uh, because mm. after a couple of days, um, the hunger and the, and we will have a mental um, addiction withdrawal from sugar. Mm. But we shouldn't get hungry. We shouldn't get tired. Um, mm. And if we do, then we're not doing something right. Typically, it's that people eliminate sugar and carbohydrates and they forget to add back the fat like, which is right, the key right. because if now you're in a in a caloric deficit and you're you're in trouble nothing's nothing's going to work um gotcha. so it the the yeah. whole thing for people who don't know ketosis is a metabolic state that is a healthy metabolic state that you get into when your carbohydrate intake is around 50 grams or or lower, which is not a lot of carbohydrate, but some people uh, need to be there because their uh, their blood sugar is not stable. They're pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain things um, that would indicate you would need to do that. Um, and ketosis is an old therapy. They've they've used it in kids with um, uh, brain injuries and and other problems. So it's been around for a long time. But if you have um, any kind of blood sugar problem, any kind of pre-diabetes, which they don't really use that term anymore, they've just moved diabetes up a little bit, uh -huh. uh, hypertension, uh, excess body fat, you know, if you're over fat, um, it means you're insulin resistant or carbohydrate intolerant, which is a better term because it refers to the problem, carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, then you're going to more than likely require a lot less carbohydrate than someone else who doesn't have any of those problems. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I could definitely see like when I was doing it, probably need to make up more for that on the on the fat end uh, just to stay satiated and stuff. But yeah, I, I mean, I remember like the sugar cravings were kind of crazy. Like I was just like, I just want a damn piece of chocolate right now. It's a tough it's addiction like, to, to, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough addiction and, and yeah. you can't explain to somebody how tough it is until they go through it and they say, wow, that's a tough addiction. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> the, the question that, that comes up, uh, is, you know, well, I'm a runner. Don't I need carbohydrates? Well, you don't. Right. Exactly. You don't. Yes. And there were, there, there, you know, there, there are now studies and I've done some of the studies and my friend, Tim Noakes has done some of the studies and we've mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about, you know, his journey to this um, to this stage of, of his life. Um, I think Tim um, was was very vocal when he first discovered the problem that he was having with carbohydrates, which was that he was eating too many. Mm -hmm. And he actually apologized to all his readers that, you know, in his <laughs> in his he had this wonderful book except it talked about how important carbohydrates were um now is that it? so is that across the board for all types of running carb you'd say no carbohydrates because i know i feel like on, on on race day some of the even some of the keto or like no carbs people will still you know hit a gel or two 
like uh during the race so is that does it apply then or yeah it, it now we we get more individual again um and mm -hmm. and there's a big uh caveat here um if you have transitioned to a low carbohydrate uh eating style whether it's ketosis or not you have to mm -hmm. transition and you have to adapt to it it could take a a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months depending on the sure. person and how strict you are um and then and then you have to experiment go and do your maf test on the track and make sure you're you're doing well and uh do a you know before your marathon do a do a 10k or a 20k run to, to test yourself see if you can get up in the morning and have your normal low carbohydrate breakfast um and get through the marathon without any extra nutrient many people can and they can mm -hmm. still perform their best um yeah. but some people need a little bit more and and i used to think it was because of the high uh the athletes who the lead pack athletes but i i, I don't believe that anymore i think it's a individual thing and you have to figure it out but the most gotcha. important part of it is that it's that you might need some some a little bit of carbohydrate uh during the run not before the run but during mm -hmm. the run because when you're consuming it during the run you don't produce uh much if any insulin and that's the key mm -hmm. if you if you consume that carbohydrate before the the run or the race you're producing insulin and that impairs the aerobic system turns off your fat burning and now you're you're in trouble so for people but so i'm trying to figure this out because i know we have a pot we have another podcast that's um it's called fuel for the soul and it's pretty they're pretty into carbs so like so um, it's it's interesting for respect i love hearing both sides so they um and i'm wondering because they uh, uh meg megan uh, the nutritionist on there like she'll carb load like crazy the week before race or the day before and i'm like so is that something if you're just not if you're not in that keto like if you're not trained to be not keto but just trained to be low sugar is that something that will actually help you in that situation and, and you're saying just don't carb up if you're in the, if you're already trained to be low sugar then you don't need it is what you're saying no i think we we have a healthy physiology humans have have a a, a way of eating and uh high carbohydrate is not part of that natural way and if you want to experiment, I highly recommend experimenting. And if you're mm. um, continually getting better in your racing, if your submax performance is continually getting better, if your body fat content is not going up, if your energy is good, um, your your hunger is controlled, um, you don't have any other other um, health health issues. Keep doing it. Um, uh, yeah. You know, I, I can't I can't backtrack on my individuality thing. And if it's making you healthy, I'm yeah. not going to argue with that. But for for almost everyone, certainly everyone I've worked with and, and other people I've I've known through the years. Um, uh, first of all, eating junk food is a known, uh, you know, there's a consensus in the scientific community about avoiding junk food there's, there's no question about that and if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet you're eating junk food yeah there's no way you're 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 making meals from scratch you're you're not getting wheat berries and grinding it into flour <laughs> and making it's just not happening right right yeah yeah i mean it's just exactly like it, there's got to be a lot of refined stuff in there no matter what you're doing but um yeah it's it, interesting it, it's definitely and i think do you think it's just that the whole low sugar no sugar thing is also just one of those discipline things where it's just for people maybe who have a lot of stuff going on in life and who have you know whether it's jobs families career and just like they're running do you think that it's 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 another thing that's just they don't want to maybe take the time to 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 really do properly and and again i'm probably talking about myself i feel like for me that's like one of the things i just feel so busy all the time and sometimes it's it's 
it, which is sad, you know, I, and as I'm growing older and I'm getting into that like midlife crisis mode in my forties, when you start evaluating like, your actual, like, like, like death seems like a thing that's actually going to happen now. You start thinking about, man, I need to think about what I'm putting into my body and just actually like, it's, I need to make it a priority. You know what I'm saying? That's the word priority. And I think that that's what people get caught up in is they, they have all these things. They're juggling life and they're yeah. looking at lifestyle issues and they're juggling those. You know, I got to get my run in. I've got to get my social life in. I've got to get my family <laughs> life in. I've got to work, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and uh, the human body has a priority. There's a hierarchy system. One thing affects another and another. It's a domino effect. It's a trickle down effect, really neurologically from the brain down. And so sure. what are the most important things? What, what are the priorities we have to be healthy and fit? Um, being physically active is one of them. We need to be active. We, we, we don't have to exercise if we're active enough. But if we want to race, we have to exercise. If we enjoy it, we're going to exercise. There's nothing wrong with that, but we want to do it correctly. And that's a priority physical activity diet is 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 a priority too but the carbohydrate part of the diet is the priority because consuming uh more carbohydrates than our body can handle that our metabolism can handle um immediately i'm talking about instantly changes our metabolism for the worst and so and there's this big cycle we go through and it takes a while to, to fix it, and we don't really fix it because we're eating more carbohydrate sooner rather than later. And then we, yeah. we maintain this perpetual thing of storing body fat, excess body fat, not burning it. So we're more tired. We're more tired in a race. We're more tired at work. We're more tired when we're sleeping. So we don't sleep as well, which sounds odd, but yeah. that's why people don't sleep well uh, and so forth. So though, though, you know, physical activity and, and, and food are the two, two of the big priorities um, it, it, with, with lifestyle. And with exercise, we want to develop our aerobic system. That's a priority there. And with food, we want to avoid the junk food. Why do you think that is that it's so easy for a lot of people to just make, like, uh, maybe exercise as a priority, but their nutrition is kind of put on the back burner? Why do you, why do you think it's because it, everybody, I feel like, cognitively knows that it's such an important part of life and training. But why is it such a hard thing for a lot of people to, to nail down? Well, it's, it, it's kind of like the cigarette thing again. Um, mm. You know, the tobacco industry today says we don't really know if tobacco is harmful. We need to do more studies. Right. They actually <laughs> say that. Now, this was said, um, you know, back when they started saying tobacco was harmful in the early 60s. And there was a big, um, you know, the Surgeon General was going to make a big announcement. And people said, well, if he says it's bad, we're going to quit. Well, people didn't quit because he didn't say it was bad. He said, we think it's bad and um, it's probably best to quit. Well, he said he thinks it's bad. It's probably oh, yeah. bad. You, well, I'm going to wait until they know to finish. If you give people... If you give people an out for their addictions, man, it's an take out. that every time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and sugar is is the same way. And I think um, like the tobacco phenomenon, we have today um, a big industry. The sugar industry is as big as the tobacco industry, and they are telling us all the time moderation. It's moderation is the key. You know, we can we can, and and then I I kind of raise my hand and say, well. Is heroin okay in moderation? <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, and of course, you know, people start calling me names uh, yeah. again. But but that's that's a reality. I mean, um, there's no moderation with with um, stuff that's that harmful to us. Um, yet we still have people uh, eating all the junk, and we still have people smoking. You know, we still have runners smoking yeah. cigarettes. I did a, I did well, a, 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 it was an article. I didn't want to do a study because I was taking information from other studies that didn't bring out the fact that 12% of the runners 
in these studies smoked cigarettes. Well, that's wild. Which is... (laughs) (laughs) And I had patients who... I had a marathoner who was a -a pack-a-day smoker. I had a triathlete who was a -a two-pack-a-day smoker. Oh, didn't you know, Bill was, Rogers smoke when he was running the running? Bill the Bill would would smoke. Um, Matt, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to mention names, but <laughs> right. I have a lot of stories. Yeah. To put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. I was going to say. Um, oh shoot, what were we talking about the nutrition? Oh yeah, I was I was going to say I, I read I saw this thing that someone said the other day where it was like, yeah, imagine if uh, it. Not that it's easy to quit drugs, but imagine if your drug you you had to take three times a day, and you just had to make sure you didn't take the um, like he was talking about like people who have problems with like you know their nutrition eating too much. It's like well you have to eat. It's not like you have to take heroin three times a day to survive. Like you actually have to eat three times a day to survive. And then so if you're already you're already putting people in a position where it's like okay now you have to make a choice between uh, a healthy healthy thing or your drug and I think most people are just going to take the drug the three times a day. <laughs> Without a doubt, it's you know we're we're a pill for every ill society. It's like the quick fix, um, yeah. and it's 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 sad. You know humans have eaten low very low carb for millions of years and it's only recently very recently that um uh that Mm -hmm. not only carbohydrates but refined carbohydrates which are very recent uh have come into the picture and we have not adapted to that physiology and as a result we 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 look at all the you know it the trickle down effect of of carbohydrate excess intake carbon the intake of excess carbohydrate, which produces uh, insulin resistance and excess body fat, the trickle-down effect are virtually all the chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, right. Alzheimer's, diabetes, um, well, uh, I mean, and, and physical the- impairment. Injuries are in there as well, and infections. I mean, we saw it in I COVID mean, all- because the people that were getting COVID were the That's most just- unhealthy. That's what I was just going to say. We saw that in COVID where it was all, all of those things that you just mentioned yep. were major contributing factors to people who died of COVID in the U.S., which is one of the reasons the U.S. was the rates were so high. Um, but, yeah, and I was going to say, you know, you, you look at a picture of a beach in the 1950s and you look at a picture of a beach today quite different um and there's no way that evolution alone has <laughs> altered that much in the last you know 50 years no, you whatever. could see there's clearly you can, something else going on yeah you could plot out the intake of refined carbohydrates um and in the last 40 years we have we're in the midst of an epidemic of over fat uh as the as the carbohydrate intake came up so did body fat um and um and like I said before, sadly, you, you see it at any race you go to. Oh, for sure. You, you, I mean, it's just general you society. It. You walk out the door yeah. and that's how it is. And yeah, it we, doesn't help we that have, we live in... Oh, go ahead. We're, uh, so I did a study um, just, uh, I don't know, three, four years ago, um, uh, evaluating the... I, I looked at the prevalence of overfat along with my... Um, co-researcher professor paul larson we looked at the the prevalence of overfat in the u.s and some new data had just come out the cdc released this new data and i thought this is up to date let's let's let me see what's going on here and uh the findings were that 91 percent of american adults were overfat it's essentially the highest n- number of all the countries. Some of the yeah, some of the countries right. compete. Um, some of the areas of the world are a little higher, but um, probably uh, I did smaller a, though too. Yeah, but I did a study in India a couple of years after that, and I, again I had some really good data, uh, actually great data, and showed that eighty point five percent of Indian adults were over fat. Oh wow. And people hear that and they say, "Oh wow!" They say, "No, that's that must be a mistake." No, it's not. It's not a mistake. How did they get that way? Well, I'll tell you how they got that way, because when I was a kid, I remember TV commercials saying, "You know, just donate twenty-five cents a week, and we'll 
will send food to all these right. starving countries. Well, it sounds good, but what did they send? Big bags of white flour and white sugar. Oh, damn, right. And, and they changed the genetics of these people in a, a oh. couple of generations. That's sadly. crazy to think about. Yeah, it and is. it also doesn't help that we live in a society where, I mean, you, you get DoorDash, everyone goes to the drive through when they go to, I mean, you're, you're already getting fast food, fast food, but you already, then you go through the drive through to get it. You don't even get out of your car. Um, and with COVID, I mean, that was and, what was encouraged. <laughs> right? It was like, don't go out, which is, still blows my mind. Don't go outside. Uh, the possible, <laughs> stay inside and order everything in. Yeah, and exacerbate all the other issues that you have. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, yeah so and, I think and it's not it, it's it's that. it's not coincidence that junk food is the most um, it is the easiest food to get is the cheapest food to get. And when right. you go in a grocery store, the junkiest foods are at eye level for children right. who are riding mm. in the in the car. You know, oh, I want that. It's got cartoons on it, just like Joe Campbell. Trust me, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's my own kids. Yeah. Oh yeah, everything from chip, and now th now there's like 45 different flavors of every single every single. It used to be just Cap and Crunch Berries. Now they have like 20 different versions of just Crunch Berries. So it's like an endless amount of. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, um, yeah. So I I don't know it's a it's definitely interesting, and I love that the I love that your training kind of incorporates all of those things. And yeah, it takes a lot. Of, it does take discipline, but like anything in life, I feel like the you know the road to reward is comes through comes through discipline and hard work. I mean, again, everybody wants a quick fix. That's I mean, you that's why Ozempic is off the chart. It's going crazy right now. It's like everybody just wants that pill to take care. Of, yeah, that's, take care of that's everything. and and the discipline, the hard work um, doesn't come with making the change. It comes with all of those entities that are in opposition of what we're trying to do. We're trying to be healthy, and yet at the same time, here's all these junk food commercials, here's all the, um, the fast yeah. food restaurants in our face. Uh, we can't go to, even go to the hospital and we're given junk food. Even, even if you're visiting somebody in a hospital and you wanna eat, right. there, there may be a Burger King in the hospital um, oh, dude! My airplane course. food, um, social food. You know, we have, we have yeah. candy. We give people candy f to celebrate something. I mean, what? I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it, I was. Uh, my grandpa was in the hospital a couple months ago. I went in. And they brought up a tray, and it was like, it was like Hershey bar. I mean, we were in Hershey, but it was like Hershey bars, like. It was all just like a full tray of sugar and stuff. I was like, this is a rant, weird. Thing it's really sad. Really. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the junk food uh, on Wall Street, the junk food world is making people rich. Oh, 100%. Um, yeah. Ill health is making people rich. You know, they love yeah. sick people because they, they spend a lot of money. Either they spend well, it or the government <laughs> spends it for them. Yeah, there's a reason that uh, preventative health care and long-term solutions that take time aren't exactly hot in the in the med medical industry. There's, there's no, no money to be made no. if people are healthy. <laughs> it's amazing how getting off junk food can change your brain and body in in s so quickly. And and whether you even if you have diabetes, even if you have hypertension, if you're full of injuries, you're over fat. Uh, mm -hmm. blah 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 you can become a new person in a few months and after a year uh, you could be off uh, most if not all of your meds that's another yeah. problem that we could get into but but it's <laughs> it's it's you know it's like a package deal a lot of great things happen uh, when you and your brain gets better uh, a yeah. lot of things happen when you take that toxic stuff out of your body i mean i, I feel like we're just and, and like you were saying you know the it's hard because it is everywhere you go and i and i i noticed this too with when i i stopped drinking for three months over you know like when i was doing marathon training for tokyo and and it's like one of those things that when you stop doing it you realize how much it's involved in your daily life or just in general like every event you go to every every like most social gatherings um and in the same way i feel like it's almost the same way with 
you know, junk food or anything else. It's just like, it's everywhere. So it's just hard to even, to even navigate those waters in a way. Yeah, it is. And if you, if you've grown up in the running community, you know about all those, I'm not going to mention the magazines, but you know about all those advertisements in the magazines. Mm -hmm. You go to a race and, you know, it, all the junk food is in your face because that's the, um, those are the sponsors. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice reward. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, so yeah, along those lines, just the, you know, it's in your face you're kind of addicted to it you're kind of into it and you're it's it's always there in your face and then you it's to actually it's just so much easier when somebody puts this product in front of your face and says oh you feel this way take this and make you feel better it's so much easier uh, especially when you see commercials on tv or things and saying oh I feel you know hypertension this all this stuff take this drug it'll take care of it instead of actually making the life choices that long term are going to be better for you but are much harder to do than just popping a pill and i think that's yeah. another layer on top of this whole conversation that we're talking about uh of you know nutrition and health and everything else and especially in america but well it's it's, it's it's who's in charge of your health <clears throat> you know when right. i say to people you you need to be in charge you know i'm in charge of my health and if I yeah. go to a doctor, I'm hiring that doctor. But people people have accepted this idea that, well, the government's in charge of my health or my insurance company is in charge of my health or my, my health care team is in charge of my health. Right. And that that's not how it works. We're we're in charge and we, we need to take responsibility for it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and. All right, so maybe like, well, I want to just like turn the conversation a little bit in a different direction. I know I don't want to keep you on too long. I don't know how much time you have, but well, I, I'm very, very interested in your other in life interest, which is music. Uh, we're big music fans here. I'm a huge fan of Rick Rubin. He's like number one on my list of people I'd ever want to meet in, in life. Cause I just think he's an incredible human. <clears throat> producer just his his mind blows my mind because he just the way that he's he works and guides things and directs creatives amazing and i know you've worked with him a lot and kind of had this symbiotic relationship with him and music and other artists that you've been, that you've advised um as what in, in regards to health and and training even so maybe talk about what you're yeah, your other interest in music and how that in your philosophy with music, because that's something that you've been really interested in, interested in lately. Well, I've always been a, a, a wildly crazy consumer of music. Uh, you know, growing up in the 60s, how could you help um, being mm -hmm. that way? Um, <clears throat> and I, I tried playing and it never worked. Um, they wouldn't teach it to me in school. And then when I got older, I, you know, didn't work. And um, about 20 years ago, uh, at the peak of my career, um, I woke up with a passion to be a songwriter. I, I, I sort of felt I wanted to give back. In, in addition to taking all this great music, I wanted to give back. And I, you know, I studied biology and Darwin, and I knew about animals singing and, and what it meant and how important it was, how vital it was. And humans sang from the beginning. That's how we um, got to where we are today. And I felt that I wasn't doing that. I almost, you know, I was a humanist and I felt like I wasn't being human. And so um, I, I, I dropped my career. I, I quit and paced for four days. Uh, wondering what I'm going to do. I, the only thing I knew was that I've got to embark on this incredible journey. And um, how do I do that? I can't do it and still maintain my career. So I had to quit. Okay, so I've decided that. Well, now what do I do? I don't even. I didn't even know what a songwriter did. I mean, yeah, you write songs, but you know, <laughs> it's quite the uh, quite the jump for. 
<laughs> yeah, and so about. on the on the on the fourth day of pacing, thinking about all this crazy stuff, Rick Rubin calls me. He had read one of my books, and he said, I, "I'm I'm calling. I want to I want to um, consult with you about my health." And I said, "Oh, I don't do that anymore. I just became a songwriter." And and we just laughed and. You know, we talked for a couple. Of, I mean, he and I were both very quiet people. We talked for two hours and mm. agreed that he would help me with songwriting and I would help him with his health. And we're still doing it today. I I just got a text from him this morning. Um, That's amazing. And, That's so random. And, and so I I literally, literally ran off to L.A. I followed Rick around for four and a half years. I, I sort of became a better producer than almost uh, than is, than a songwriter uh, because I saw what so he was doing. So were you just doing. hanging? Were you just like hanging out at Shangri La and just uh, as with him and kind of when other artists were there and kind of or were you advising? Like, what was this? What did this relationship look like? It was strange because I was not going to do any of this healthcare stuff anymore because I, this this idea of becoming a songwriter was overwhelming. There was so much I had to learn to play. Um, uh. the, you know, I learned I, I knew three chords on the guitar, and that just wasn't enough. So I had to learn guitar. I had Unless to learn the piano. Band. Yeah, I mean, I, and I had to figure out this creativity thing what, what what is this about and i realized that well i had a creative job you know i developed the 180 formula that was a super creative thing i developed all sure. these biofeedback um programs all these um the the two-week test very creative thing um um so i just thought okay i need to channel it now into music and um and i i was the fly on the wall uh, in at Shangri La or m the many other studios we we would go to, um, and and I realized uh, soon that w when when Rick reads a book and he really likes it, he buys a big oh. box of it and he hands it out to all his friends. Oh, that's cool. Nice. And I realized that he had done that with one of my books, and so now <laughs> really? I'm going to these studios with all these, you know, well known. Oh, man. Uh, great singer songwriters and and they know me and i you know i'm planning on sitting in the corner and just watching but no can't 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 do that you know <laughs> what so is my didn't... brain doing when i'm you know when i have oh, this God. writer's block thing what what's going you know yeah. and and you know i get into that um discussion and um and so i mean that's pretty amazing so it's like when and I love like Rick Rubin's kind of holistic way of drawing out the creative process from artists and kind of just no, you know, finding what they need to come out into um, into their songs and music. And I feel like the, yeah, and there is that other end to it that I, I could totally see um, you kind of helping out in that other way, that more of a whether mental health way or just like general health. And I can see how that can combine to create a pretty cool force. And a lot of a lot, you know, people don't understand that a touring musician is n no different than an athlete. And uh, that's yeah. how I treated the ones that I worked with. I treated them like a, a, another athlete. Oh, man, imagine. I mean, think about just, uh, you know, like Red Hot Chili Peppers or like a, sh a live show, like I mean, even Rolling Stones, which is just wild to me for three hours on stage every night. Right. Plus the travel, the sound checks, everything in between. And you're just basically, I mean, especially if you're a drummer, holy cow. I mean, that is a workout. It is. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible yeah. workout. And, and, and these people don't, you know, the image of these, of these musicians is that they're out there every night uh, jamming and then they come back to the hotel and they get rowdy and party. And, <laughs> right. man, they just want to go to bed after the shows and they don't, they yeah. can't have consecutive shows uh you know in the course of the week they need a they need uh, plenty of time off um, right and they need to eat well and they need to i mean there's just the the the, the warm-up is an important part of it the, the the 
musicians I worked with literally physically warm up like an athlete before a show. Yeah. And they cool down. Yeah, I mean, and they, they I, well. I believe that because, and I feel like maybe that's a thing that's also changed in the last maybe 20 years because the 80s were wild. I mean, you know, that was just, I feel like it was just a lot of heroin and partying and Jack Daniels all night long. I mean, embodied by bands like Motley Crue and that. And then even the 90s, I feel like Oasis was like the last like real rock band where there's a lot of <laughs> booze and alcohol and other like, shenanigans evolved um yeah i mean like i said I the, like it's the, changed that's the image and and the image was was portrayed mostly by young uh musicians who who could you know who had the yeah. energy to stay up all <laughs> night after a show and then wake right. up the next day and of course uh you know amphetamines to get going in the morning and other things in the evening were all part of the game um of course that doesn't last too long and the the bands that had and the musicians who have um endurance are the generally are the healthier ones yeah and so what's your um what's your philosophy then on music and just life because i know it you, i feel like i mean music for me is just such an integral part of my life i feel like it's guided me since i was a young you know since i was like a teenager i mean I, there's just so many moments in life where you put together with a certain song or a certain feeling that just ties you down to that moment. And even, I, I remember, you know, you, you hear sometimes about maybe patients with dementia or Alzheimer's and you, then you put a song, like you put headphones in their ears and it just like brings them back. And I mean, there's something so yeah. powerful about music. Oh, it's powerful. Um, we are hardwired for music. Humans have always had it and we still have it. We don't use it to our benefit like, mm -hmm. like we used to. Um, and P, you know, this is, this is, uh, an important thing. Runners, athletes in general, um, often forget that the most important part of their body is the brain. Mm -hmm. And if we have a better brain, we're going to be a better athlete. It's, it, it's as simple as that. And so, sure. uh, humans from the beginning had, uh, two very important things that were joined together, and that's music and movement. And when we have one, we have the other. And um, so today, if we have more music, we make our brain uh, more functional. So we can have a better gait, for example. When we're more rhythmic, we have a better gait. When we have yeah. a better gait, we're faster at the same heart rate, we're more economical, and we get injured less. Because right. our wear and tear in the joints is less and so on and so forth. So, so music is, like a, is a vital thing. And people, um, you know, it's like food. There's so much junk music. And today, a lot of athletes are, are relying on junk music, uh, which you hear at the start of a race or you, um, you know, you, you see in the movies, um, yeah. you know, it's the Rocky music. The Rocky music is like rah rah let's go let's overtrain you know yeah do you feel i so i heard you talk about the junk music on the on extra mileage podcast and i was i was trying to like do you think that comes off as too i don't know not pretentious but kind of like <laughs> you know how it's like the classic guy in uh, art school who's like um you know more into like the the clash or the whatever than than the what's on pop radio and you're just like Oh, come on, dude. But do you like, I'm trying to figure out how you bridge that gap because you know how some people are going to be like, look, just let me listen to my J Justin Bieber, you know? <laughs> like, well, that could listen. be good. That could be good music if you like it. Um, but, but when the industry creates music artificially, mm -hmm. you know, when songs are written by committee, um, when, when whole albums can be, uh, uh, created by artificial intelligence. Oh, right, exactly. This is this is a problem, and it uh, it has an adverse effect on our brain. So, um, and junk music is connected with noise pollution. So, think of elevator music. Think of the music we listen to on hold when we're on the phone. I mean, this is this is junk music. This is noise pollution, and it's unhealthy for the brain. All the yeah, all the singer songwriters, if you like them or not, um, 
whether it's rap or hip hop or classical and you know heavy metal or everything in between that's real music you know we all have our personality and when we create music our personality comes out and um there's there's a wide spectrum of healthy uh, music, but you have to f- find the music that you like the best. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. I mean, I never really considered. I mean, I have considered junk music before, especially when I was younger. I hated, you know, <laughs> g- generic pop music and uh, a lot of a lot of different, you know, things that were popular. I should say I was very much into more indie stuff and things like that. So I get the concept of junk music. Um, and do you think that? when when listening to that that actually so like how do you think that has a negative effect on i mean whether it's training or just overall life if you're if you're listening to that well number one it doesn't have a positive effect and we can measure brain waves and we can see that it it actually doesn't create a um for example it may not create alpha waves in the brain and if we don't get into alpha you know that's where your running high comes from then we're, we're not getting a good brain benefit. And number two, we can show that, again, through measurements, and now they're doing MRI studies, F- fMRI studies, that um, demonstrate all this in the, in the brain. Um, yeah. We can see that there's, there's stress created. We could measure the stress hormones associated with some of these, um, some of these uh, 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 junk music sounds. So if you're listening to more creative music or singer songwriter, the things that actually aren't just a formulaic, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, um, throw some claps in there. Um, it, do you think that that's, does that, so does that, are you saying that creates those, that alpha? That, that like more exactly. Alpha, that, right? that okay. w- the alpha state is one of the benefits. Alpha uh, lowers stress hormones. Alpha makes us more creative. Alpha enlists more of our brain activities alpha as a result of all of that will improve our gait um and if we're an athlete improving your gait is i mean that's a big part of uh the game uh because if you have a better gait you're going to perform better um and and you know and, and get injured less so I'm not a music guy when I'm running I used I think when I first started running I used to listen to music and then I kind of just you know uh like prefer the quietness I guess um what so what are you saying that we should listen to music while we're running or are you are you suggesting using it for a different in a different way I, I'm suggesting we not listen to music when we okay. run I suggest Sweet. listening to our body instead and I've always I've always that's always been my recommendation because I want people to be aware of their athletic body and when we are aware of our body our brain can compensate better our brain is okay. always compensating to um, uh, to to a run, especially in a race. And the better we compensate, the better we we race. And again, the less we're, we're, we get hurt. Um, well, it's interesting because yeah, when I I remember when I used to run with music, or maybe sometimes if I ever, if I ever do again, it's like your pace. You change your pace depending on like the beats per minute of the song. Um, and you then could, even yeah. even your heart rate and stuff changes, you know, without a doubt. And and so there are some people who are saying to themselves, "Well, wait a minute. There are studies that show that music helps exercise." Well, that's not what the studies show. It just makes what you the, go faster. <laughs> what the studies show is they they rev you up, they get you out the door, yeah. they it, they they cause you to kind of drive the the the. Um, the, the workout. Um, so as a result, your heart rate's higher. Um, and there's, there, there was a study that may be more than one now that says um, music will help you cover the pain. Well, you don't want to cover the pain. If you have pain during a run, it means something is wrong. And if we <laughs> use music to cover it up, it's obviously a, 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 a problem. So yeah, basically, in, the bottom line is that music can help you overtrain and help you not think about the fact that you're overtraining. So what I like to do is um, uh, rely on music to build a better brain, number one. Use music to maybe relax you as even before you go out the door, as sort of as part of your warm-up. Now I'm going to be relaxed, my stress hormone is lower, I'm going to 
have a better workout as a result. And then after your workout, after your cool down, use music to to rebalance your autonomic nervous system. Get your sympathetics and parasympathetics back in balance so that you can start recovering really well, really quickly. Yeah. And that's a I wonderful like that. thing to do with with music, but not not during uh, activity. And, um, you know, people, a lot of people know when they go to the gym, there's this banging music. And um, yes, it's unhealthy, but it's a it's a big social thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I'm working, it's interesting or when I'm writing, I this is and maybe you can let me know your thoughts on this. So when I'm writing stuff, I can't listen to music with lyrics in it. Uh, it always throws me off and I just can't get into like a deep, like creative state. But I can, if I listen to a, a deep focus playlist where it's instrumental, um, a le- more electronic or instrumental type stuff, I can definitely get into a deeper writing state than if I'm just not listening to anything. So what's, what's that all about? Well, number one, different personalities have different styles of creativity. So some people, when they're working, they will always have music on. Mm-hmm. And it's in the background. And most of them can, can have a lyrical song without a problem. And, that's, you know, and so they listen to music when they're in a social environment. They listen to music when they drive, um, right. when they're studying. And, and other personalities... <clears throat> excuse me um they don't want the music they don't want any distractions when they drive they don't have music on right. um and and so there's a personality issue there basically extroverts listen to music when they work and introverts don't mm-hmm. um Interesting. but in the book i i talk about that and i talk about how to expand our personalities because that's going to make us healthy um, I was surprised in doing research uh, for this book to see that about ten billion dollars a year in the U.S. is spent on books and programs on how we can change our personalities. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm wow. thinking, God, I never even heard of books like that. But apparently, they're wow. out there. And people want to change their personalities. But I, so what I suggested in the book is that. You can use music to change your personality because different personalities are attracted to different kinds of music. Oh, yeah. And so if we listen, if we're a real hardcore introvert or a hardcore extrovert and we want to become more of of the other, we can listen to the kind of music that that the different groups are are attracted to. To the point where I I suggest, for example... um, a classical pianist who only listens to classical music uh, on the piano. I suggest that person listen to uh, a, a Nirvana song or a, or a Metallica song. And sure. th- this person may may hate it. However, it will make connections in their brain they've never made before, which is the definition of expanding the mind and having yeah. a better brain. and. Yeah. In many cases, these people will say, it sometimes takes a few days, but they'll say, oh, wait a minute, that Nirvana song, he he was using the same notes as I use in this concerto. Uh And, and, you know, so we, 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 we end up with a, with a better brain. And if we're a Metallica freak, you know, listen to (laughs) Moonlight Serenade. Yeah. um, And the same thing will happen. Um, we surprise our brain. Surprises. This is the the nice thing about listening to new singer songwriters is that you're surprising the brain. And as as powerful as listening to the oldies, we we love listening to. Surprising the brain and, with a new song is even more powerful a stimulation for the for the brain. Yeah, and I feel like that does open you up to more creativity because I know. Mm-hmm. And, and it is interesting the way it changes with age to our experience because almost like a palate for food in a way, because, you know, when I was younger, I wasn't super into hardcore or um, just different types of music. But then I, I even like Metallica, I feel like I didn't start listening to them until a few years ago. And then I was, uh, I think it was just Ride the Lightning. And I was 
I just listening to it, I'm like, this is such a good, it's such a good album. Like, For Whom the Bell Tolls is just amazing. Like that, like, if, and I just would listen to it over and over. And you, and it's almost like, it wasn't for that moment in life, maybe um, back then, but now it's like somehow fits in there. And you Yeah, know, that's what, yeah. what music does, is, is that um, even though we may not know the songwriter, or the 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 band that's singing it, if if they're not one and the same, <clears throat> um, we put ourselves in the music, mm-hmm. and some music uh, w- we fit really well at this point in our life, and sometimes we don't, and and later on we we do. I, I listened to um, Bob Dylan's uh, "Blood on the Tracks" the other day. Oh man, dude, that's and, one of my favorite. And I still ever. cried. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if you don't cry, there's a problem that you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like, how can somebody do this? It was like, oh man, tangled, uh, tangled up in blue. I mean, yeah, just, that starts the uh, the album. I like, love that song so much. But <laughs> um, yeah, great album for sure. And yeah, I, I love that idea though. Just like the way, and I think there is so much that we even again don't know i mean there's so much we don't know about the brain but even when it pertains to things like music that's clearly such a big part of who we are and how we think and how we operate and it's pretty much still an uncharted territory as far as how it affects us it's from a research standpoint it's um, finally coming together but what i've done with this book is i'm a clinician so i like reading all those fmri studies i like um, I like seeing what um, um, some of these researchers have done, w- w- where they would make people listen to music and then they they would um, you know measure uh, all kinds of things. But then they leave it at that. It, it's fascinating. But I want to take it the next step, which is how can you, the reader, um, benefit from music? If if this is true and that's true, well, how could I benefit from that? And there's all kinds of things I have in the book about, um, a, 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 again, it's a self-evaluation. Um, I, I have this problem in my brain and, oh, here's a way to correct it. I mean, we literally can correct brain injuries. That's what I spent much yeah. of my career doing. Yeah. So music is, is a, a wonderful way to, to, to correct a brain injury that many of us have. Yeah, that's amazing. And we'll put a link to that book and obviously your website in the description of the podcast for anyone who wants to grab that. Um, so let me ask you one more question because, you know, we went pretty long here. By the way, great conversation. I loved it. Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, since you do love music, what are your, some of your favorite? Um, it doesn't have to be top five albums of all time, maybe even just your favorite albums right now. What are you what are you listening to? If you ask me tomorrow, they'll be different. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, I, I listen to Dylan a lot because I, I can't believe that he's as good as he is. Um, um, yeah. And I listen to Dylan even more in the beginning when I first started playing, which I never had done. I, I never sang and I never played in the studio. And I and I sort of use Dylan as, okay, if he could sing this way and kind of bang on his guitar like that, I, I, maybe I could do that too. <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, uh, Dylan, um, I've been listening to uh, Lisa Hannigan. Lisa Hannigan, um, if you know uh, Damien Rice. Oh, yeah, Damien, right. Damien's first album, and I think she appeared on some of the songs on the on the second album. Um, okay. Lisa was that voice, like the George Harrison hidden voice. Lisa was yep. the hidden voice, and she played a lot of instruments. Yeah. And, um, like, and she so- ended up... Uh, you know, going off on her own. And she has three albums. And if you just listen to the first one, then listen to her second one, and then the third one, you see her progression. Uh, and I see how her, her brain progressed. And so I, I listen to, to Lisa um, a lot. Um, I, I have some, you know, new newer stuff. Um, Dan Wilson, you've heard some of Dan's songs because so mm-hmm. many people cover them. Um, yeah. Um, gosh, you know, Rick will give me some, some suggestions that somebody's working with and I'll, and if he's working with them, I want to hear it. Um, <laughs> For sure. but some of the older things, of course, the Beatles are the standby Cat Stevens, uh, yeah. the Rolling Stones. Oh man, I love um, Cat Stevens. He's always like 
growing up, that was one of my favorite artists. I yeah, mean, yeah. What team, what team an, um, tiller, an amazing and, talent and uh, yeah, just. So sometimes I get you, I get a oh, I get a, a comment from people when I'm you know when I play a gig, people come up at me afterwards and say, you know, you remind me of Cat Stevens, and it's such a wonderful compliment because my yeah. lyrics are I I write lyric, you know, heavy lyrics, yeah. and um, simple. Um, simple music, but m very melodic. And yeah. one of the best moments in my musical life, uh, there have been many, but w one of the best was I got a text from Rick. I don't know where I was. It was sort of, I, I, I don't even know, but it was a text. He says, I'm in the studio with Cat Stevens and he's he just played a new song, and it sounds like one of yours. <laughs> what? Oh man! I yeah, you need to frame that on a wall. Okay. <laughs> Take a screenshot and frame it. Yes, that's crazy. Oh man, that's amazing. That's so I, I but I, I listen to uh, classical music uh, as well, and um, okay, I, I I I try to I try to expand my mind with new stuff and expand my mind with with things that i'm familiar with because you always hear them differently and you sometimes physically hear them different oh yeah um, we 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 train our ears as the more we listen and especially when the music's not in the background and especially when we choose the music right. that's really a a, a key I was, I was just telling someone the other day um like Radiohead's OK Computer is probably one of my favorite albums ever. And every time I listen to that, you I hear something new in it. You know, something else is like there's because there's a lot of instruments layered. The bass lines are amazing. Just but you in and, and it's been, what, 25 years now. And I still every time I listen to that album intentionally you can still hear just pick up on different things that you didn't realize before I mean, yeah i i remember i you know I, I you know with the music thing my 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 brain has progressed musically from a listening standpoint in in many other ways too but i remember listening to maxwell silver hammer one day and right. and i hear this little bubbly organ and i'm thinking uh -huh. Oh, the, there's no organ on that. So this must be one of the anthology takes or something. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I checked it, and no, sure enough, it was the Abbey Road version of Maxwell Silverhand. There was an yeah. organ, even after thousands of listens, I never heard <laughs> right. it. So um, that's an example of of how we expand our 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 brain, expand the mind. We can now sense things. We become more aware of life. We become it's more kind aware of, of ourselves. Yeah, and it's kind of amazing too because at the time when they were making that, it's probably like George Martin was just like, "Yeah, let's throw this part in here," and he just knew it fit. And it sometimes like maybe it's going to sit there in the background, but it comes back around. It's an integral part of the song. Yeah, it's it 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 certainly was in the background. And mixing is such an art. This is where Rick really really comes in uh, in a great way. Is is that the mix? You know, the mix has yeah. to be just right and. Um, and people, people sometimes say, well, I, I don't like listening to rock because you, you can't hear the lyrics. Well, you can hear the lyrics. If you can't hear the lyrics in most music, you have a brain injury. Yeah. And I talk about how to, how to fix that. Or you're listening to Pearl Jam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, in which case, <laughs> you can hear them, but you can't understand them. <laughs> or that song, um, Louie Louie. Yeah, right, from exactly. from way back, and uh, we we would nobody knows. Oh yeah, no one knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, last question: Beatles Revolution Number Nine. Is that actually a song that's good for your brain or bad for your brain? <laughs> oh, it's good for your brain. All right. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Uh, one I, time I, there was. A, I sometimes skip it, but but yeah, you have yeah. to listen to it uh, more it than once. I I've listened to it a bunch of times. One time though, one of my friends was doing a uh, hundred miler. And he was like, uh, anyone who donates five dollars or whatever, you know, he's donated for charity. And he said that you can pick a a song for every you know two dollars or five dollars you donate. And I I did him dirty and picked Revolution Number Nine <laughs> <laughs> for the middle of a hundred miler that may or may not, hopefully it wasn't through the night. He was probably losing his mind. <laughs> but uh, 
yeah anyways all right well i think we can wrap this up but honestly this is a great conversation i really appreciate you coming on was, uh, thank you robbie thanks for having me yeah. and yeah this is this is such fun stuff to to talk about whether it's running oriented or gymnastics or race car driving or just being human it's all this really the same thing yeah definitely all right phil thanks so much hope hopefully we'll uh, get the chance to talk to you again soon yes thanks <laughs>